In this series on people in my family who've contributed to Bible translation, the next person is my dad, Daniel Case. He's been through a lot in his 75 years of life, from growing up in Cuba to serving in the Vietnam War to being a medical missionary and working for decades in Bible translation for the Chetino people of El Carrizal in the mountains of Oaxaca, Mexico. I really admire his wisdom, tenacity, humility, and servant heart, and I wanted to share his story with you. Here we go. Well, my first memories are when I'm four years old, and then we, our family was already in Cuba as my parents were Channel Evangelism Fellowship missionaries, reaching out to the kids and uh, adult teachers on the island. And so it was quite a experience to grow up on a tropical island and uh, surrounded by tropical fruit and, and, of course, the tropical culture that Cuba has. So I learned uh, the Cuban style of Spanish right from the get-go. So I, I basically learned from the age of two on both languages, English, Southern English, which my mom was very good at, and then, uh, of course, the Cuban Spanish. And uh, so that was... Uh, just the kind of the waking up, the first first memories, and a lot of fun just being able to year round run around in shorts and <laughs> t shirt, and you know when it got down to sixty degrees in the winter time, everybody was dying of cold, and we thought it was so cool we could see our breath sometimes, and those were really unusual. The time there was uh, very influential in the learning two cultures, and especially the Spanish island culture of Cuba. Growing up with people from Spain that had actually arrived on the island straight from Spain. So I had a Cuban grandfather. He was a Gallego, which he spoke the, the Gallego dialect of Spanish, very guttural, and it was hilarious. And he was just a really funny guy, and he loved us kids. And uh, so it was fun to have a grandfather uh, idea yeah. for us kids because we were so f- we were so far away from our own grandparents, and most of them died before we got very old. Is seeing the different cultures, you know, the African Cuban culture and their music, which was real heavy on the drums, <laughs> and then the flamenco style from Spain, and and then a mix of all that, uh, which was uh, very foot-tapping, catching type of music. And uh, I grew up with lots and lots of music, and my dad was a musician. He played the clarinet, and, and then he learned to play the trumpet with me, and uh, so we would play duets together. And later on, my little brother learned. So we had trios of trumpets, and that was awesome. So music was very, very important. And the, uh, that island culture is just loaded with with all kinds of uh, music. And I grew up basically in the golden age of tro- tropical music there. And uh, I was very impressed with my dad's linguistic ability to learn Cuban Spanish. It was so different from other missionaries that we encountered. Uh, They just never learned Spanish to any degree that made them sound authentic at all. And so as kids, we'd make fun of these other missionaries (laughs) because they were, they would slaughter the Spanish and we would just cringe, you know. Uh, We arrived in Cuba in 1949, not too long after that, a dictator started running the country. And then in 1953, there was an attempt to overthrow the government, and that didn't work out. And it happened to be on my birthday. So 
for years, I couldn't really celebrate my birthday in any great way because I would be looked at as a sympathizer with the rebels. <laughs> so, but my birthday is the 26th of July. And so, since 1953, it's always been the 26th of July movement or revolutionary movement. And they have a black and red flag. And in about 1956, they started again trying to overthrow the government. And this time they were successful in getting a foothold on the island and with Fidel Castro and Che Guevara and those other characters that were uh, that had gotten in a boat from Mexico and made it all the way to the southern part of the island. And uh, most of them died on the beach because... Somebody told the army uh, what was going on. So just a few of them made it into the jungle. It wasn't long after that that the rebel forces started growing and moving towards towards our area, which was at the other extreme end of the island, on the west, side, west end of the island. So they uh, basically recruited farmers and malcontents, maybe, and uh, teachers. And little by little, they just started taking over the island. By 1959, January 1st, they basically took over the island. And our little town where we lived uh, was completely surrounded by the rebel army. And uh, if the dictator hadn't abdicated the day before and flown away, uh, we would have been in the middle of armed conflict. And so, so January 1st, 1959, we woke up with a 50 caliber machine gun in the bell tower of the local church. <laughs> <laughs> and our balcony of our place w was at the same altitude as uh, the uh, bell tower. So and there was martial law, and uh, we all had to stay inside for three days until they consolidated their forces. So it was pretty uh, uh, tough times, uh, a lot of questioning, you know, what was going to happen next, and what was this all about? The next six months was kind of like a honeymoon, and everything seemed to be super nice, and and uh, and seemed like there was more religious liberty, that sort of thing. But it turned out there was just a, a mask to try to to get people on the side of the revolutionaries. They would use scripture. Uh, Fidel Castro would read from the Bible every time he had a speech in front of a, a million people in a in a big square in the Havana. So a lot, lot of us Christians, we thought, well, wow, this is really amazing for a political figure to use the Bible. But it was just a ruse, basically, to, to win favor with the 95% that were either Catholics or Protestants, <laughs> you know, on the island. My dad had to teach me how to to hit the dust if we heard gunfire. And uh, so I remember one day coming home from church and I was crossing the street and all of a sudden a machine gun went off a few blocks from our house. And, uh, and so I hit the dust with my Sunday clothes on. <laughs> And we found out later that uh, five guys were shot to death that were believed to be with the rebel army. So the, the dictator's police force tortured them and then shot them to death right near our house. So that stuff was going on. It had this unsettled feeling <laughs> a lot of the time. So that that was kind of the, the 11 years that we were there. And my my mom and dad's ministry with children was extremely successful. The Cuban people really appreciated uh, their efforts, and, and to this day, there's still uh, ministry going on that they started, so up and down the island. The island's, you know, 750 miles long, so it would take two days to drive from one end to the other, and my dad did that quite a number of times, and, and every once in a while, I got to go with him. Otherwise, I was homeschooled, so I... I enjoyed being my dad's right-hand man and helping unpack the flannel graph board and the, and the suitcase where he carried his ventriloquist doll. And he became very good at ventriloquism. And it was a real big feature in evangelistic outreaches for the kids to come. And my dad played the harmonica, a real big one. And then he could play one that was so small that he would act like he swallowed it. And uh, everybody really enjoyed that.
So there was a, a point, uh, I still remember it like yesterday, July 4th, 1960, we went to the beach with two other families. So us kids would get in the water and uh, so you imagine three families with all the kids and we loved the beaches in Cuba like a big swimming pool because of the coral reef. And But I noticed that the adults were sitting in the shade having a serious talk. So I wanted to know what was going on. And so I left the water and sneaked up to see what was going on. And I heard one father say to the others, so what are you going to do? And the other one said, I don't know. And well, in my whole life, I'd never heard an adult say, I don't know. I thought, whoa, <laughs> something is, this is big. And uh, anyway, they were basically discuss discussing how things had gotten pretty serious as far as uh, foreigners, especially from the U.S., being there. There was a whole lot of criticism going on between the two governments, and so we were beginning to be despised instead of treasured, which was my experience the whole time. Everybody wanted to be friends with, with us. We were invited to people's homes and stuff. It was really very special to feel. And all of a sudden, it kind of switched, and then you started hearing people yelling, Cuba si, Yankee, no. That's Cuba, yes, and Yankees, no. I didn't know what a Yankee was. I'd never heard the, the term. Uh, my dad, after that 4th of July situation, he, he went to the American embassy and said, what's going on? We're seeing this and we're hearing that. And what can you tell me? I, I have a wife and five children and I need to make some decisions here. And they basically told him that they couldn't say anything. They were not able to give him any information. He was a bit upset about that, as you can imagine, and especially since the day before he had heard on the radio a speech by Fidel's brother, uh, Raul, and he had said, this revolution will have reached its climax when the only thing you can call your own is your toothbrush. And my dad heard that. He never hardly ever heard any speeches, but that one he heard, and, he, and that's what he took to the embassy, and they wouldn't answer him. So he went from there to the dock and bought tickets uh, two weeks later on the, the ship that would travel between Havana and Key West, Florida. We couldn't tell anybody hardly, except for a few trusted Christians, that we we're actually going to leave. Because we, le we lived by ourselves way out in the boonies. Something could happen to us and nobody would have really known because the way things were with the authorities then. And by then they had a spy on every block of every city, of every town, every village. And uh, so that was kind of tense. So I remember July 24th, we stayed up all night and had all the windows blacked out and packed the, the car because the, the ferry had a place for so many cars on it. And we uh, loaded it up and uh, at four in the morning, we opened the garage doors and my brother and I pushed the car. He was nine years old and I, I was 13 and there's no room for us to sit inside the car. We sat on the tailgate of the 53 Chevy station wagon and the rest of the family all five of them were on the front seat <laughs> and uh, thankfully it was a full moon so we didn't have to turn on the engine or turn on the the lights and we were able to roll out of town because we lived on the top part of the town and uh, get out of town before we had to turn on the engine and it took us a couple hours to get to Havana we were hoping we wouldn't be stopped the Lord blinded and made sleepy all the guards along the way, and so we were able to make it onto the ship. So later on that morning, of course, the ship pulled out of the harbor, and my elder sister and I, we, we were on the rail crying because we were pretty sure that we would never see the island again. So that was our time in Cuba. Formative years, as you can imagine. The next day was my birthday, so... There was no cake that year. <laughs> we were traveling. Well, my dad 
realized that we'd been hearing a lot of negative stuff about being Americans, so he wanted us to see a little bit of Americana. So he headed for Washington, D.C. to show us what Washington, D.C. was like, because we'd never been there. And uh, that was really amazing. We camped out in a campground outside of the city, and we were able to tour the White House, and we were able to go in the Capitol and go up in the Washington Monument and, you know, all those things. I think it had the effect that my dad wanted for us kids uh, just to have a sense of what what was the truth and not all the propaganda that was around us when we were in Cuba. And from there we went to Washington State where my dad's parents lived uh, on a farm outside of Chehalis, Washington. We were there for six months kind of just to catch our breath and figure out what to do next. And then my parents' home church was in Los Angeles, and that church was a really big church, and it had home, uh, homes for missionaries to stay in during furlough. We qualified for such a thing, and so we we moved into one of the, the homes that they had. Of course, I had to enter school in the U.S. I was no longer homeschooled, and, and my linguistic ability in English was pretty reduced since I really— hadn't used much English except for just class time and in the family. But we always lived where uh, there were no other English-speaking families. And you only spoke Spanish with your brothers and sisters. Yeah, especially when my parents weren't around. So <laughs> if they were around, we had to speak English. But, I mean, it was just easier to speak Spanish uh, from our experience because that's all we d- we spoke most of the time with our friends and so on. And you were going through reverse culture shock? Right. So getting to the States, the culture was so different for us. And especially for me, I I wasn't able to adapt very well. I didn't feel at home. I tried to make friends, but I guess they thought I was too weird. I don't know. But (laughs) And I got straight Ds in English for several years because I just could not figure out what they were talking about. And I'd learned English mimicking my mom's version of English. What I didn't realize that I was not actually pronouncing things exactly like she did. I was just approximating them. And so when I was in college, uh, I was taking a linguistic course and they and they asked me to write out what I was this particular thing, how I said it but using linguistic symbols and phonetically. So I got a basically a zero on the test, and <laughs> I went to see the teacher. I said, I don't understand why I got such a poor grade, because I did well in everything else uh, in linguistics there. She looked at it. She was just so puzzled. She said, because, you know, her assistant had graded it, so she that was the first time she saw the paper, and... And she looked at it and looked at it, and then she finally said, do you speak another language? And I said, yeah. (laughs) Oh, she said, that's why. (laughs) So it turned out that I was speaking English, and it sounds correct, but I'm using different positions of of in the mouth and so on. And then then I also, because of the Spaniard influence in Cuba, I developed this real nasal quality to everything I said because that's kind of classic with the with the Spaniard influence. The experience in, in school was basically uh, I made friends with the weird people in the school <laughs> that, did, that weren't from there. So my best friend in junior high was from Czechoslovakia. <laughs> he was a Jewish refugee, and he had— uh, they had escaped to Australia and then to the U.S., and so he spoke English with an Australian accent. I thought that was cool. So we were best buddies during junior high, and I got involved in music and all the schooling that I had, which was really nice. So I got to be part of the band. You know, I, When I got to finally to my senior year of, of high school, I actually got a C in English. I was really proud of that. <laughs> But I was starting to understand structure and grammar and all that stuff, you know. 
And I could write pretty well. I didn't know how to spell very well because of the conflict in my brain between how to spell things in Spanish and phonetically, which is Spanish, and and then English, which doesn't follow any phonetic rules. <laughs> I got this idea to go in the Air Force and get medical training since I wasn't able to get it in Mexico. And I had tried applying to medical school in, uh, in the States, but I hadn't gotten anywhere. So in uh, 67, I, I entered the Air Force and was sent to San Antonio in the middle of the summer to uh, undergo basic training. That was uh, quite an experience, as you can imagine. So your parents were down in Mexico at this time? Yeah, at this time, yeah. And then what did they think about you joining the Air Force? Well, they didn't like that idea at all, especially because of the war. So we should probably back up to something you didn't mention when you were a kid in Cuba about hearing the voice of God. I guess this is a part, an important part of the story. Yeah, I was seven. Um, we lived in the central part of the island for a year. And during that time, my sister uh, got injured by some boiling oil in the kitchen. So around the corner from our place was a medical surgical clinic. So that's where uh, she had to go every day to have her bandages changed. And so I went with my sister. And so while they were doing that, I noticed that there was surgeries going on and there was a, a little window to the surgical suite. So I, I wondered if I could see what was going on and they said, sure. And they put a little uh, bench there for me to stand on because I was short for the porthole that was in the door. And so I got to watch different surgeries. Uh, that was fascinating to me and just woke up a whole nother world for me. And, and my parents were already very med medically minded, you know, taking care of us. And they had a bell on the roof of the medical surgical clinic. And so whenever they were gonna do a surgery, they would ring the bell. And so I get on my bike and zoom over to the medical clinic and uh, to watch whatever was going on. And that was my routine every day, just about. And uh, But one day I was rounding the corner up there and I heard this very loud voice calling my name, uh, telling me that uh, he wanted me to be a, a medical missionary. And uh, I fell off my bike because <laughs> I, I was so startled. I really didn't know what had happened, but I was like, okay, um, I had never had that experience before. And uh, of course I know this, I knew the story of Samuel already. So I thought, okay, I guess the Lord is speaking to me. So, so uh, coupled with watching surgeries, I, uh, I started uh, looking at the medical manual that my parents had. So that became my textbook for a long time. I read that thing from cover to cover when I was seven. So, and then uh, because of the cultural change from Cuba to the US, I had a hard time with my dad for, for a good while because I, he, he was no longer this one that spoke Spanish perfectly and uh, related to Cubans as if he was a Cuban. And uh, all of a sudden he was relating to everybody in English and I couldn't do that. I was handicapped in that way. And he, I think that he thought that I could adjust to the U.S. culture just automatically because I was an American. But <laughs> it was, I was stuck really for a long time. And uh, it was, that put a tension between us uh, for for a long time. So you felt like he had, he had become a different person. Right, exactly. And how do you get from the Air Force to the mission field? Well, that was my my second experience at uh, hearing God's voice. And uh, I had finished my first level of medical training. There was um, a competition for grades. And if you got high grades and placed in the top 10 people of that generation, then you got to choose where in the world you're going to be stationed after that, after that training. So I, I placed, uh, I think, number four or number five. 
I really enjoyed it. I ate, I ate it up like you know, nobody's business. So they herded us under uh, the top ten into this room with a blackboard and names of uh, different places in the world that we could be assigned, and we were told we could choose. So there was Germany and Spain and Italy and several places in uh, the Orient, including three places in Vietnam. By this time, my rebellion against my father had turned into kind of vindictiveness. <laughs> so when they got to me and they asked me where I wanted to go, I asked uh, of the three places in Vietnam, which was the one farthest north? In other words, next to North Vietnam. So the guy in charge said, well, it's Tui Hua. And I said, okay, sign me up for that one. Why farthest north? It was the most dangerous place. And I thought, well, maybe if something happens to me, my dad will feel bad. You know, <laughs> It's really a stupid idea, but uh, that's what happens with with, the, with rebellion. And uh, everyone in the room turned around and looked at me like I was out of my mind. And I was. I was really... So they gave us two weeks to go home and say goodbye and then report to fly out to Vietnam. I and another buddy had ordered a taxi to go to the airport, and we were sitting in the day room of the squadron, and all of a sudden this guy comes running into the squadron and yells out my name. So I said, yeah, that's me. He says, you're wanted by the first sergeant on the double. Well, it can only mean one thing. You know, something is really wrong. If you... <laughs> So I ran to the to the first sergeant's office and uh, reported, saluted, and reported, and gave him my name. And he said, um, "Well, your orders have been canceled. You're going to Washington D.C." I was floored <laughs> completely. I, I even asked the first sergeant if I could sit down because I felt like I was going to faint. But to me, it was it was like the Lord walking in the room and saying, "Okay, Dan, that's enough." You know, let me, let me run your life. You know, this is not the way to go. And it turned out that the Surgeon General of the Air Force had requested the top ten graduates to be sent to Washington D.C. for specialized training in cardiology and and other specialties, which was probably the highest training I could receive in the Air Force. So I was there for over a year for training, and then I was sent to the Philippines. And that was a real godsend because there I was able to learn a lot about the Oriental culture. And I really needed that for the future when I came to Mexico and, and ran into the Oriental culture out in the mountains here. So while I was in training in Washington, D.C., I got involved with the navigator uh, ministry to military people. So I was discipled by an ex-Marine for the whole time I was there in, in D.C., that was very formative for me, and getting into Bible study and to memorizing Scripture and learning how to evangelize and that sort of thing. It was kind of funny because he was, being an ex-Marine, he's a really focused type person, and, and when I first met him, I used my line, which used to make everybody think, oh, this is this guy, you know. Is a good Christian or whatever, and because I would say, "Oh, I, my parents are missionaries," you know, and they, most people would say, "Oh, wow," you know. His answer to me was, "Well, do you have a quiet time? No. Uh, do you memorize scripture? No." So, anyway, it was it was a wake up call for for me, and uh, so I started out at the bottom, like everybody else, and that was a real. Real blessed time for me and formative for my future ministry. Well, I was in the Philippines right. during the Vietnam War, and all the, the wounded were flown to us that were the most severely wounded were flown to us in the Philippines. It was two and a half hour flight on hospital airplanes. So they basically the whole bay of an airplane was just full of stretchers, and they would arrive basically not even cleaned up from the jungle. They just had an IV and morphine ready to go right to surgery because there was no hospitals of that caliber in Vietnam. So I, sh I was shipped back to the States and finishing out my four years in the Air Force. 
in California, and then I I started college when I got out, and so the GI Bill financed my college, and so I was able to take science courses and linguistic courses and Spanish. I I went to three colleges, two junior colleges, and then the University of California at Davis. So halfway through the my my college, that's where I met your mom. We were on our way to my brother's wedding, my younger brother's wedding. We were in Mexico City. We were going to be there about two weeks, and, and during that time, uh, uh, Dorothy Dorothy's mom and dad decided to go to the church where my parents attended. They're old friends from Biola days. Uh, my father-in-law Neil Nellis. So he wanted to to see his old friend. Uh, they had been roommates at Biola, and they had done evangelism, street evangelism, in downtown L.A. together. And so they had a lot of lot of neat history together. Yeah. They were both musical, and so they really spoke the same language that way. So in Mexico City, they uh, they showed up for a church service. I was there with my parents, and Dorothy was there with her parents. And uh, when the service ended, I turned around to walk back to where my parents were. I saw Dorothy, and that was my my really my third experience where God just intervened in a miraculous way and and said to me, Dan, this that's going to be your wife. The voice was so loud that I couldn't mistake it. I remember from when I was seven years old, it was the same voice. My youngest brother was standing next to me, and I right away looked at him to see what his reaction was to this loud voice. He was expressionless. <laughs> Nobody else heard it. So I said, oh, okay, I, I know what's going on now. But I was quite surprised, as you can imagine. It was the last thing on my mind uh, at that moment. And then um, I saw her walk back to where her parents were, and I remembered her mom, because I'd met her mom some years before, uh, probably five or six years before, when I had, when I was studying in Puebla in Mexico with my parents before going to the Air Force. So the next six months, we wrote letters, and then we saw each other at Christmas time. Of course, you didn't tell her about that experience. No, I didn't. Right. I knew that would be like using a, some kind of leverage. <laughs> I wanted the Lord to put that together. And she was at Moody Bible Institute. Because of my background in Latin, I wrote her brother, her twin brother, and asked him permission to write his sister. Because that's the right thing to do in, in a Latin culture. And uh, and he really appreciated it, and uh, he gave me permission. So so uh, so I got a green light, and of course, she was quite shocked when she got the first letter from me because he had no idea that I had had any interest at all when we had met. So we both had two years when we met just to finish school. Things worked out really well to be able to get married in Southern California because her mom and dad's church was there, and my mom and dad's church was there. So so in August 1975, we got married. One of the things that uh, was true is that we, we both wanted to go to the mission field. We both had a an idea that it would probably be somewhere in Latin America, but we didn't have much more idea than that. But some of it had to, to do with ministry, and some of it had to do with medicine. In our first six months of marriage— we read books out loud to each other. In fact, we didn't have a TV for many years, <laughs> so we tried to stay with books. And And uh, I, for, I forget how many months into our marriage, uh, uh, Dorothy's sister and her husband, they sent us a book called Peace Child. And it's a story of a missionary couple that went to part of Papua New Guinea and how... Uh, they encountered this culture and how they they had the experience of misunderstandings about the gospel and uh, the frustrations. As we read this book, uh, which is just an amazing book, really well done, and it didn't uh, hide the vicissitudes and the difficulties of of missionary life. 
as we read it, it began to dawn on us that uh, we were, both of us were kind of like them. And because part of our plan was for for Dorothy to have uh, nurses training after we got married. But by the end of that uh, six months, you know, we, we had this pretty clear idea that that was something that really was attractive to us to work with a tribal situation. One of the, the things that was told to me by uh, uh, one of the speakers at a navigators conference that I went to, and then it was repeated to me by a guy that was discipling me, you know, why do something that others can do and don't do instead of doing something that nobody else wants to do and only you can do? Uh, the uniqueness idea, or that very few people can do. That resonated with me and Dorothy, because I knew there was a lot smarter people in the world than me. <laughs> My grades showed it at <laughs> high school. I also knew that in a tribal situation, you really didn't know I need to know a whole lot to save people's lives. And uh, since I'd been doing that in the Air Force for years, and then after I got out, I had opportunity to work in the medical field uh, also. So all all that just really wove together to to give us uh, something to shoot for. And then we started investigating what missions had that kind of a situation that would be interesting, uh, that we could combine these two things, ministry and medicine and all that, and linguistics. And the star on the horizon was uh, was Wycliffe Bible Translators. They had the training and they had the, the information about where the needs were that really nobody else did. So we decided to go to a linguistic school with uh, Wycliffe in Oklahoma. Uh, after Dorothy finished her one year of uh, nurses training, so we started that, that training and we had applied to that mission in Oklahoma, at the University of Oklahoma. Yeah. Uh, the Summer Institute of Linguistics had a program there. And Dorothy's twin brother and his wife were at the same course. We had a really special time together. And then, so then we took our second semester of linguistics in Dallas. And at the end of that semester, which was yeah, close to Christmas, uh, Wycliffe asked us to represent the mission in the northeast of the U.S. They, they could tour for several months and visit different churches and put on a, a multimedia presentation about translation. That sounded to us like a good deal. So Wycliffe had you going around doing slide presentations for churches to raise money and well, awareness? To raise awareness, yeah, of course, support for the mission. We went to 68 churches in um, five months, I guess it was. And uh, so we were mostly in the Northeast and uh, in Ohio. And it was interesting because we had a, a two-week hiatus between being in the Northeast and Ohio. And we got to be in Pennsylvania with some friends of Dorothy's parents in Mennonite Amish country, right in the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania. And uh, I told our hosts that uh, we had this presentation. If if there was some church that would like to see it, we'd be glad to put it on because we didn't, you know, we had this downtime. And a Mennonite church invited us. I had never been in a Mennonite church before. Uh, Dorothy had, but not, I had. And they didn't use instruments, and but they sang. You know, talk about two hundred people singing in four part harmony. It's like I died and gone to heaven. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> but anyway, we put on the presentation, which is, goes back to Uncle Cam's days of, if your God is so great, why doesn't he talk my language? Which uh, a Guatemalan Indian said to him. That night, uh, a couple came up to us afterwards and invited us to a meal for the next day. And uh, it turned out they were Mark and Gloria Zook. They were really called by the Lord that night. He was a dairy farmer. He had married a widow with two children, and they were he was 30 years old, and uh, she was a little bit younger. His parents were Amish, and he was Mennonite. So he was only 30? 
He was 30 years old. And yeah. Wycliffe yeah. told him that he was too old to He's learn a new old. language? Yeah. How old were you? 30. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> goodness, that's hilarious. Yeah. So, uh, so they sold the farm and there are 100 cows. And so we were together the next summer at SIL, also with Dorothy's twin brother and his wife and their baby. And uh, that summer, they were turned down by Wycliffe. I, had, I decided, along with Dorothy, to ask David and Wendy, her twin, to, to pray together with us about the idea of maybe serving in Bible translation near each other in different dialects, but near each other, uh, so that we could be uh, like a support team for each other. Because at that time, they were sending out people by themselves, basically, uh, couples. So that was our prayer request. And so then we started looking at the ethnologue to see if if there was such a situation. And turned out that the only place was in Mexico, where there was adjacent dialects that hadn't been reached yet. So we kept praying about that, and we asked the leaders if we could be assigned to those those two tribes, and and uh, they gave us the green light. But it was really disappointing to us that, that Mark and Gloria were turned down. But uh, being good Dutchmen, they they didn't take no for an answer. They went and applied to to uh, New Tribes Mission. They're the ones that put out the film Itao, which which documents how they reached a tribe, the Muk tribe in Papua New Guinea not too long after that, which was quite a dramatic story and had a real victory for the gospel. So that's where we got the green light. And then that uh, the end of, of that year, which was 78, we headed off for Chiapas, Mexico for jungle camp training, the four of us. <laughs> so we ended up in the jungles there of Chiapas and uh, living amongst the Siltal Indians. Explain to people what jungle camp is, for those who don't know what that is. Uh, just the jungle camp uh, got its name because this is a, of most missionaries were going to a jungle situation, and there was, it was an effort to prepare them for living with little or nothing, <laughs> and uh, how to use a machete, how to kill a chicken, how to can food, uh, meat, how to can vegetables, how to study a language uh, from zero, uh, even though we'd had some practice with that. We were encouraged to try it out there in the, in the jungle. And we we're living in, uh, you know, basically having to have mosquito nets and pretty primitive facilities and learning how to take a bath in the river, which was ice cold. And the jungle rivers are very, very cold. And they taught us how to, to navigate with a dugout canoe that weighed a ton for five people. Uh, those kind of things, which in some situations, in some countries, uh, that was necessary information. They even had a period of time where we spent about a month by ourselves in a, in a village, learning how to get along and how to take care of ourselves in that kind of situation. So what would you say, how many people, what percentage, who went to jungle camp ended up actually needing that experience, ended up living in really primitive situations like that. Now, you guys obviously didn't end up in that sort of no, situation. No, I never did a canoe after that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I would say the very few, actually. And after our generation finished jungle camp, they, they redid everything. First of all, because Mexico closed down the, the ability to have that kind of a situation in the jungle. Uh, so each entity in Wycliffe, uh, SIL worldwide, decided to have their own training program that would be focused for their area rather than try to do everything in one place in Mexico. And I think that was a, a good move. So that was how many months? Four months. And I, I'm assuming a considerable expense. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. How much were they charging you for all that back then, your experience? Yeah, it was, you know, like a good size rent. <laughs> and plus we had to fly in and we had to fly out. And 
do all that sort of thing. And if you had kids, you had to experience it with your kids. With the kids, yeah. So Dave and Wendy, they had Janiel, uh as a baby. We could only take a duffel bag with us, basically three sets of clothes for the whole time. And I think it, in general it was really good because there was there was opportunity to to see what you could handle, you know. It was funny because they they even taught us, you know, how to give a shot. Of course, I already knew how to do that, but but a lot of people hadn't, and so that was good training because you sometimes you need to know how to do that for emergency purposes. So tell us the history of the village where you guys chose to go. There had been several attempts to reach those people before, right? So the the first people that tried to visit this village area which is the Chitino region in the mountains. They were Leslie and Kitty Pride from England, and they had arrived in Mexico in 1960. And at that point, they they had to arrive there on mules. And another missionary took them and allocated them there in the municipal town that sent her to the whole area. But things did not go well with the authorities and with the priest in, the, in that village. The priest, I guess, felt threatened because they weren't Catholics. And uh, so he started telling people that to keep their children indoors because these people ate children. And he said, I, I can prove it. See, they don't have children. So they ate their own. Now they came to eat yours. They they had never had children. And, <laughs> and of course, that didn't help. Uh, he also told people not to sell them any food. So they actually ran out of the food that they had brought with them. And uh, the Lord put in their path uh, a gentleman named Damaso from uh, another village uh, about four hours away. He found out their predicament, and he was one of the authorities of the tribe. And so he th- he thought it was not fair the way they were being treated. He didn't know anything about them. He didn't know why they were there. But he said, that's not nice. <laughs> so he loaded up his donkey with food and uh, went over to see them. There was an airstrip at that village, and the priest had uh, asked the townspeople to fell all the pine trees around the the strip and cover it with logs so that the plane couldn't come and and land there because they had a radio and they were going to call a flight in. So Damaso sized up the situation, and he said, well, I'll help you leave. But then he maintained a relationship with them, and he started a correspondence course with them, the Bible study, and eventually became a Christian. And he then became our host when we came there to visit you know, almost 20 years later. And others had tried to go, but they would either met at the trailhead and say, don't come any farther, or, or some got very sick and had to leave. And, it was very, very dark, very, very difficult. Was the same priest there 20 years later? No, but the one that was there is, is, had the same ideas. But we arrived with a daughter, <laughs> so that was a little different for our experience. So we were just there for a short time, and then we that visit after jungle camp, and then we went to Mexico City, helped out in the administration there. I found out why they wanted me to work there because I spoke Spanish. And it turned out that almost all the leadership of SIL didn't know how to speak Spanish, hardly at all. Because back then the emphasis was mainly on learning the indigenous languages. Exactly. And so nobody was encouraged to learn Spanish. They found out later, of course, that that was a mistake. Well, that toward the end of our time in Mexico City, when we were hoping to then transition to uh, our assignment, the leftists got in bed with the Catholics to make it very difficult for the government to continue in a relationship with SIL because the government is secular and the leftists and the Catholics were saying they're not secular, they're they're a ministry. So some people in administration of SIL tried to say, no, we're just a scientific organization. Because back yeah. then and still today, because of the Spanish background of Mexico, it's highly Catholic and thus highly anti-Protestant, highly anti-proselytizing. And the U.S. winning wars against Mexico and taking a lot of the land. So that, that adds into the, the mix of uh, nationalism 
they beat that drum in the schools quite a bit as far as the the uh, imperialists, Yankees, causing so much trouble uh, for Mexico. If I understand correctly, Uncle Cam, the founder of Wycliffe, had set things up with the Mexican government that it had established a purely secular relationship, scientific, linguistic. We were just coming to help your, your languages flourish and develop, be preserved. And, and in quotes, uh, useful literature. And that was done with the president, Lázaro Cárdenas, and he actually r- drove into the village where Uncle Cam and his wife were and saw what they were doing. Uncle Cam had planted uh, some kind of an orchard or something. So Lázaro Cárdenas had an indigenous background himself. He saw that they were trying to improve life for the people there, not just the language, but in other ways. And so he told Uncle Cam, this is what we need in Mexico. Bring as many as you want. And so it got to the point where a pharaoh who who did not know Joseph came to power, and then they started to realize these people are also evangelicals, which is evil to Catholics in Mexico, and um, they need to get kicked out. Exactly. So one day, uh, us that are in administration were called into the Secretary of State's office to uh, have a conversation. And she said to the director and, and the rest of us that, that because of certain pressures that they were no longer going to renew visas for those that had uh, student visas. Because at that time, anybody new coming into Mexico was, instead of getting a residency, they were being processed as students. And uh, they had to be renewed every year. So uh, that was a, a kind of a shocking statement. But because I had been versed in the law, I said to her, because nobody else was talking, they they're all like sitting there stunned. And I said, oh, what about those who have children born here in Mexico? Will they be able to continue? I said, oh, yeah, of course. Well, she was just quoting the law because that's what the law says. But I didn't want to say that to her because that's one of the things I was trained. You never tell a government official uh something that they already know and act like you know more than they do. That, that'll get you nowhere real quick. <laughs> so uh, she said, yeah, there's no problem. That was encouraging to me. I said, well, you know, some people will have to leave, but at least I won't have to because I have a daughter born in Mexico. But on our way back to the, the headquarters of, of SIL in Mexico City, the director turned to me and said, don't tell anybody what she said. Because uh, you know we have a lot of single people, and they'll feel bad if you know other people get to stay and and they don't get to stay. And so I was forbidden to to mention that, and uh, that was kind of discouraging. Because knowing that, I had to process this people's leaving papers, papers for people with with children born in Mexico. So I went to my friends and in, in the government offices, and and I said, Hey, can uh, can I get a few more months on this visa so they can finish the school year. I just tried, you know. I said, well, the worst they can say is no. They said, sure, no problem. Here, give me that, you know, <laughs> stamped it. And so I was real excited. And so I went to this one family, and I said, look, I got, you, I got you a few more months so you can finish the school year. And they were so angry at what was happening. Uh, you know, their whole lives have been turned upside down you know, with this edict. And they said, doesn't matter. We're leaving now. We don't want to. We don't want anything to do with Mexico. And uh, I thought that was sad. So, under the guise of fairness to the single people who didn't have kids, they made everybody leave, even without knowing the truth. Right. Well, it didn't make any sense to me. So yeah. So it was a a big surprise, and so. When our visas ran out, we had to leave the country. But being in the States for a while, I asked the, uh, the, the new director if he would allow me to be a test case, no pun intended, to, to get uh, a visa as a parent of 
of a Mexican-born child without any uh, connection to SIL or anything else. So uh, he said, yeah, go ahead, try. And so just in a few months, we had our visa as residents of Mexico. I went to the director in Mexico City, and I, I presented my papers. And he was uh, countered by somebody else, and they never allowed anybody else to do that. So if I if I understand correctly, there was this mass exodus of, of linguists, missionaries from Mexico, and many of them ended up in Arizona. And that's when SIL built this huge base in Arizona, big housing complex and everything. Right. For people to be there and continue working kind of from a distance. Yeah. And so one of my assignments was to help language uh, assistants or language helpers from these different villages get a visa to go to the States to work with their translator up in Arizona. It's right outside of Tucson. So the U.S. Embassy at that time, uh, we had been doing that for years because there were other translators that had to be in other places in the U.S., and they wanted their language helper there. And so uh, there was already a uh, set up with the U.S. Embassy for that. So I would just walk into the embassy with this person, and it was just basically a rubber stamp deal. You know, I always had a letter from the SIL. And so this brings us to changing missions. How long had you been in El Carrizal before you changed missions? For two years and maybe a little bit more. And during that time, I mean, we'd made visits, but in 83, we were able to build a house out of Adobe and so we could be there more, more time. Uh, have our own place because we were basically borrowing a room. That that time was really key in us getting to know a lot of people in the village and uh, help a lot of people with medicine. We would take stocks of different kinds of medicines with us. You can imagine a, an area that had never seen an aspirin, that had never seen anesthesia for pulling teeth or or anything of the sort. I mean, it was just zero. Yeah, there wasn't even vaccinations for children. So we watched people carrying babies to the cemetery. About half of the, all the babies would die before they were two years old. So it was a very, very sad period of, of history for that tribe. Once, once we got the government involved in uh, vaccinating in the, all these villages, we had a population explosion. <laughs> now, when you first arrived there, there was also a famine? Yeah, not too long after the rains didn't come. There wasn't corn. So we worked together with uh, Mission Aviation Fellowship to fly plane loads of corn from here in the city to all the way out there. And for months, I didn't even go to the village because, uh, first of all, there was no road. And second, if I got on the plane, there would be a whole sack of corn that couldn't go. So we spent a lot on uh, buying corn and flights to get the corn out there. It really helped a lot. People really appreciated it. It was a very critical time. So you got to this point where you needed to transition out of Wycliffe. So tell us a little bit more about why that happened. As we were winding down the, the time in Mexico City, our leadership was interested in trying to salvage something. And they tried making contacts with uh, the Catholic Church and trying to find somebody who'd be more sensitive to what we're trying to do as a mission and uh, or as an organization, better said. So I still remember uh, one of the last things that I participated in and during that time was uh, the the leadership brought in a Catholic priest to speak to to about a hundred of us uh, with SIL. So, so the idea was to make friends with the Catholics so that they could get back into the country. Yeah, but this this person, his idea was completely different. Just to to make it very simple, he he basically said, "We really appreciate the work you've done." Uh, hand us your translations as you leave the country. We'll take care of them. And I almost jumped out of my chair. Uh, I was 
And I looked around and nobody was even blinking. I, I was, I didn't know what was wrong with them. And my, my first thought was, well, excuse me, but you know, you've had 400 years to do this. and You've had 400 years to give these people the word of God in their language and you haven't given them anything. And now what are you going to do with our translations if we give them to you? Yeah, exactly. Uh, there was a few priests that, that worked with translators, and they had some good relationships that people had different visions for the tribes that they worked in. But it was really very rare by comparison to the area that we worked in. It was never never cozy at all. <laughs> I know that there are some, and in, in also in other parts of Latin America, where the Catholics have endorsed translations done by evangelicals. And and it's it's interesting because for up until the sixties the only thing that people heard in these tribal areas was Latin. Early in the sixties they decided that the national language could be used. And so I had the privilege of working with a man who was a cantor in the Catholic Church. And he had learned to say the Mass in Latin. This gentleman was like my dad's age. He had grown children and all that. And and he had learned to read Latin. And then when they switched, then he had to learn all over again in Spanish, which wasn't his mother tongue either. And then a priest gave him a Bible, which was unheard of. And he started reading where it said the Mass came from, you know, because they have references and all that. And he started seeing discrepancies. Why does it say this here in the Mass and over here in the Bible it says this? And so one day he shows up at my place. He walked four and a half hours from the main municipal town to our house. I had never met him. I didn't know who he was. I didn't even know he was a cantor. And he had a sheet of paper with questions on it, like 20 questions. And he said, uh, can you help me with these questions? I said, sure. What is it about? You know, I mean, I was, I'd never had that experience before. Uh, he's obviously a literate man. He could write and uh, read. And I know now he was just a genius to be able to do all he had done in his life. So his questions were, you know, he'd read a verse and he said, this verse says this. Well, what does that mean? So he's obviously, there's a vocabulary in the 60 version of the Bible equivalent. It wasn't a 60 version that he had, but but at that style of Spanish. And so that was kind of out of his reach on some things. So I answered his questions. When he got to number 20 and finished, he got up and said, thank you, and walked away. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea what was going to happen, but I answered the best I could, and we looked at the scriptures and so on. So uh, a month later, he came back. I walked up to my door, and he had another list of 20 questions. And at the end, he says, well, what do I call you? So he, he was trying to come up with a title for me, like priest. And I said, well, in our understanding of scripture, uh, between believers— we're brothers. So I may be your older brother, but we're still just brothers. You know, I don't have a, there's no ranks in, in Christianity. I so shook his head. Okay. So he picked up his stuff and left. And another month went by and he, he said, uh, would you meet me down at the river? I want to be baptized. And so we did. We went down to the river and he was there because he, the, the river split the tribal area in half. And so he was on one side and I was on the other. So we met at the river. And uh, so he and his wife were baptized. And his two adult daughters were looking on. And another young gal, 14-year-old, also came and was baptized that we had witnessed to before. Yeah, so that was an amazing experience. Uh, and, uh, of course, he quit his job as a cantor and he suffered huge persecution, people throwing rocks on his roof and calling him names and wishing the worst for him. But he hung in there till the end. So that was just to sum up some of the Catholic influence there, just, just how dark it, it is and was. And so that's why you felt that it was pretty audacious for a priest to come and say that. Right. Yeah, I didn't accept that. Well, that began my wheels turning as it well and then when I was able to get a visa and and still 
there wasn't any movement towards letting people come back. I was getting quite uncomfortable with being in the mission. And then at the end of 84, there, we had a conference in Arizona, and someone brought up an agenda item about whether or not to allow Catholics to become members of uh, SIL. And I couldn't believe my ears that it was even be discussed, to be honest with you. I was like, what? I mean, but there is a faction within the, the group, especially some of the older, medium older ones that uh, thought that that would be fair or, or that would be useful or I don't know. But So they, uh, they passed a resolution that basically said something to that effect uh, over the protests of several of us. And uh, so that was, that for me was the end. I just didn't see how there would be any blessing for that kind of uh, idea. Wasn't there someone in leadership who had a picture of the Pope in his office? Yeah, my boss. Yeah, he he had been able to go to Rome and and uh, kiss his hand, and well, he said that was the most important experience of my life. So let's go from here to what happened initially as you were getting established in the village. Yeah, we were having a. A very interesting time getting to know people, trying to be a bit useful while we were learning some of the words and vocabulary. We also wanted to do helpful stuff because for the people to understand why we wanted to learn their language, that it never made any sense to them. (laughs) Why would you want to do that, you know? You know, Spanish and English, you know, so they didn't have a real high regard for their language necessarily. But I just remember early on trying to figure out how to say, do you know Jesus? And it's part of an effort to get conversation going about Jesus Christ. And so I found somebody to tell me this phrase, do you know Jesus? And so I, I started writing it down. And I identified the word for the I, and I identified the word for enter, and I said to the individual, well, it sounds like you're saying that uh, has Jesus entered your eye? And I said, what is, oh, yeah, that's the way we say it. He kind of laughed because he'd never thought about the whole idea of getting to know somebody is because they've entered your eye. So... That was a very steep learning curve right there to try to tune in to their worldview and how they they see even that concept of getting to know someone. And it's a tonal language, right? Yes. Uh-huh. How many tones? It has three level tones and one rising and one lower. So what about the resistance? Yes, there was a, a concerted effort by... The Catholic uh, leadership, uh, the priest and the nuns, to turn the people against us, uh, kind of spread doubt about uh, what we were doing. Like, for instance, we got the government to come in and vaccinate children against childhood diseases. And uh, they spread the word that we were trying to kill the children with these vaccines, even though we never vaccinated anybody. It was the government workers that actually came and stuff like that. And so there was an important number of children that died because they believed that. But those that didn't believe it, they have children now, adults. So it was just a very sad thing to see a, a dad carrying a little box to the cemetery. And it's every week we would see that. And he would just usually be by himself. And uh, thankfully, most of the people started believing the truth about that. So now there's no trouble vaccinating the children. The municipal government uh, began to be headed by a a new uh, president of the uh, whole tribal area. He was from a Spanish-speaking town and really in cahoots with the the priest, which would be normal for most of the Spanish speakers are, are pretty fanatically attached to the Catholic system. And the priest got him to call an assembly of all the heads of families in the whole area, especially the authorities from all 29 villages that belong to the municipal uh, area. 
we're talking about 100 square miles. So I got a notice to show up for this assembly, and I was kind of blindsided. I had no idea this was going on. The subject matter came up with the secretary of the tribe proposing a vote about the question of whether or not we should be allowed to live in the village of El Carrizal. But before that, uh, this I guess the priest had designated one of the nuns who spoke Spanish to ask me questions in front of everybody. And there was 300 men at that moment, plus about 50 women, which weren't supposed to be there according to the cult- culture. But uh, the nuns had gathered up a whole bunch of ladies to, to be there. And uh, she asked me 10 questions in my name, where I was born, uh, you know, the basic stuff, what was I doing, all that. And then it got to the last question was, that what religion was I? So I answered nine questions, and uh, I'd honestly forgotten which was the last one. And so she said, well, I noticed that you didn't answer the, the 10th question. And so I said, oh, what was that? And so she repeated it. And I said, oh, okay. And uh, so I prayed. I said, the Lord help me know what to say because I know what she wants me to do. She wants me to shoot myself in the foot, condemn myself. So I started talking, and the Lord gave me words, which I had no idea of the impact of my words. But the Lord knew. And I, I basically said to her, and of course, so everybody could hear, because it was dead silence. You could not hear anything. I said, well, before I was born, my parents uh, decided to follow the Bible and and to follow Jesus Christ. And I decided to do the same thing, follow my parents' example. And that was all I said. And then the secretary said, okay, let's vote. So he said, well, we're going to do it backwards this time. We're going to ask for everybody who is against to vote first and then whoever's in favor to vote. So he said, okay, everybody who is against, raise your hand. And nobody raised their hand. And I was stunned. I thought, what? What's going on here? And and then he said, okay, uh, then how many are you in favor? And nobody raised their hand. <laughs> so then I was really perplexed. I thought, what? Uh, you know, I didn't know and understand what was going on since I wasn't in that part of that culture very well. So I just stood there and the president started crying. I'd never seen a man cry out there before like that, you know, in a bar- it was an embarrassing situation. And he comes running over to me, says, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I said, well, the people have spoken because I didn't know what they'd spoken. I really, but they had <laughs> because the question was put to them. And I found out later that the people said, well, of course he followed his parents. He honored his parents by following in their footsteps. There's nothing wrong with that. So you asked the wrong question, Mr. President. And so we're not going to answer any of your questions. You you were asking the wrong question. And uh, it was devastating. Asking the wrong question as to whether you could stay because it was obvious that you should. Right. It was a total repudiation of of his efforts at the behest of the of the priest who didn't even show up. He had the nuns do his work, dirty work for him. <laughs> I was so surprised, but later on, uh, our, my friends started explaining to me what had happened because I, I saw my friends there and they didn't raise their hands either. And I thought, well, maybe I'll have two, three people say, you know, we're for you. But the culture was so different, my understanding of it, but it was very encouraging. And of course, by then, you know, most people in the whole tribal area uh, knew who we were, would walk uh, hours to, to get to our place to get medical help. And, and so the word had spread that we were useful in some way, not because of what we believed, just because we, were, we had practical things to share with them. I even took a two-man saw out, you know, to, to help people make boards because they had no, no way of making a board. Stuff like that. Uh, it's just very simple. So how did Bible translation start? Well, we had to, of course, learn enough of the language to even ask questions. And 
and not rely so much on Spanish. And, of course, we had to develop an alphabet because no one had written the language before. Our goal was to make it look as much like Spanish as possible with the with the different uh, consonants and vowels that they have in their language. But you can imagine we had 15 vowels instead of five. Well, that was an interesting challenge. And, but anyway, we, we were able to build a, a body of vocabulary and to start doing simple things in the Book of Mark. And by that time, if we wanted to get anything done, we actually had to leave the village and go to the translation center for a week or two weeks with a, a language helper to try to make some headway because the time when we were in the village was uh, so intense with meeting people's needs, physical needs, that it was very difficult to do anything with the language. But it was about three or four years when we actually started working on the Book of Mark with Francisco, who was our language helper at that time. As he, when he first started out, he was not a Christian, but eventually he became a Christian, and we worked with him for several years trying to figure out the best way to express things. And his his ability to understand things in Spanish was very, very limited. And so, as a result, the, the translation was very limited also, just because of the concepts. You know, how do you explain some concepts when the person is not a bilingual? So that was that was the challenge there at the beginning. That's all for the first part of this interview. In the second part, we'll hear about how my dad broke his neck in an accident out in the village and more. Thanks for listening, and I want to say a big thank you to my dad for taking the time to share his story. We'll see you in part two. Until then, this is a podcast where we believe the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey, and pointing to Jesus. Jesus.